Yes. Um, I actually, in some classes, were told that humans fall more on the promiscuous scale of things. And the question was, why we have marriage and all of this, you know, support for studying the middle relationship, all relationships. And somebody suggested that it was instilled by the Dutch society, the males who would not get a mate naturally, so they kind of brought out the social system of marriage. And, 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 like, I don't know if. if <laughs> So the, the uh, story is that, um, there is that some people have interpreted some data from human cultures as supporting female promiscuousness. And if that's the case, where does the idea of monogamous, social monogamy, so we have to distinguish between social monogamy and true monogamy. So all those birds that Elizabeth is talking about, um, like the fairy wren, um, is so, they're socially monogamous. Like the, he builds a nest, she comes, they live together, and so and then that was the surprise that they were that the, what it looks what it looked like from the outside it wasn't what actually was going on genetically. So the question is, why do we have in many societies social monogamy? So. so it's interesting, when I was reviewing some of this information about human mating systems, depending on which author I read, they would interpret the exact same data as either meaning that we were social monogamy or serial monogamy, because we, you know, we do know there's divorce and that people will, will then form another pair bond, or whether we could be considered a promiscuous species. I. Th I think that a lot of times we put those labels on that, and it comes from our own headspace. I think if you look at the data, it suggests that women are promiscuous, but usually when in the past people have called us a promiscuous species, they meant the boys. They meant the men were promiscuous and not the women. And I think that's very interesting. I think the way of looking at it as thinking about, um, about what the women are doing actually gets us a little closer to the truth. As far as whether um, marriage is because um, it's the only way men could kind of have a mate, I actually, I, I think that that's probably a little bit backwards because what do the men need it for exactly? Um, the women need it for helping to raise the offspring and to raise the, you know, to raise the children, but the um, potent, but if the idea is that men couldn't get a mate without agreeing to it, I think that our data about f women's promiscuity suggests that may not be completely the case. Well, that was like those males who could not get uh, a mate. They would never have a single mate in their entire life. Not as a result of the never got a single mate. Whereas the studs like forced all the females. I think. I think taking the elephant seal data where you have studs and duds and applying that to humans is a little dangerous because it doesn't seem like we work that way. We don't live in harems. We don't have some men that are mating with lots of women and, and you know, I don't, we don't see, <laughs> I'm seeing faces going, well, I don't know. But we, we don't, other than um, a, a, few, uh, a few human societies, we tend not to see those sorts of mating patterns in humans the way we see them in elephant seals. If I could just add one comment, we should um, keep in mind that the sexual dimorphism in humans, which is one of the strongest, since it's entirely genetic, almost, because you raise the males and females in the same environment, um, that roughly 5%, I think, isn't it, in terms of body weight, is quite mild. Yes. I, I don't know if that came out. So we are sexually dimorphic in size. Size is one of the best predictors of, of who's choosing and, and, and who's being chosen. And so it's statistically significant. It's universal almost, um, but it's very mild. And so we have to think of all the stuff that we, you know, we like telling stories, but the hard, hard data suggests that it's probably mutual choice with a little bit more over on the female side, just, just with that one bit of data. Yeah. That's, that's, okay, right at the back. Yes. The elephant seal graphs show it's true that for males, uh, there was uh, uh, most males didn't uh, never had a mate. But you all, the, it seemed to show also that most females never had a mate or, or never 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 had uh, a birth. What was that about? So, so the el the elephant seal graph, which was supposed to was used to show that the range in the number of babies you can have if you're a male is much larger than the range in the total number of babies you can have if you're a female 
for both males and females, a very large proportion of the individuals, <coughs> excuse me, had no children. So, for the males, it's because the 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 um, very successful males are getting all the mates, and there's none left. But why are there many, many females that also don't have any offspring? It turns out that actually by showing you a simple graph, I, I left out part of the story, which you rightfully clued in on. Actually, a lot of those females don't leave any surviving offspring, but they have offspring. So in that zero category, about three quarters of the bar would be filled with females who had at least one offspring, but it did not survive to adulthood, which makes it make a lot more sense, I think. Okay, so we'll go here and then up there. Yes, sitting down. Yep. Um, okay, so the interesting variety of pieces in primates sort of made me wonder, um, do other primates uh, copulate just for pleasure? Like if a gorilla has a harem and certain of his wives are uh, pregnant, would he still copulate with her? Like, Do primates copulate for pleasure? Other primates. <laughs> yes. Um, I can elaborate, there, especially in, in chimps and also what are called the pygmy chimps, the bonobos, we see um, a lot of copulation that is clearly strictly for pleasure because it's when the females are incapable of, of um, getting pregnant. And in these um, species, especially in the bonobo, we see what uh, we would call homosexual sex as well. Um, we, we see this in, in several other primates, but not actually so much in gorillas. So it's, it's interesting that as humans we say, oh, you know, he's got this harem, right? So we think that they're the sexy ones. Well, the sexy ones are the chimps. They're the ones that are having sex all the time. And, and it has, and actually, um, some anthropologists call it, um, you know, they talk about greeting behavior. They call it the really big greet. Because they go up and they have sex really quick, and then they, you know, go about like picking nits off of each other. So it's very common to have sex, apparently, apparently for pleasure, perhaps also for bonding reasons. Is it only primates, or is it? Other it's also known from other animals. Um, it's known from, I'm trying to think of good examples, dolphins, penguins, many other species that where they appear to have, oh, rabbits, um, where they, uh, I guess I didn't have to say that one, um, but where they, where they have sex apparently when there is not an opportunity to have, to have that result in an offspring. Yeah. One, two, and then down here. Yep. Well, you mentioned uh, human promiscuity data, but are there male-female differences when you actually look at... Okay, so uh, Elizabeth sort of glossed over. Are there differences between males and females across cultures in the level of promiscuity, or rather, are there data to suggest that? It's actually really hard to get those data. I looked really hard for it because I think that that's kind of what you need to get at the whole, you know, stereotype of men are promiscuous and women are chaste, and um, and it, it's very. I wasn't able to find good data on that. In that study I showed you with the 48 different countries, there are differences. The men tend to be more promiscuous in their socio-sexual ranking than, than women do. Does that mean they're actually having more sex? I don't know. But of course, for that to happen, you know, there's, sex requires partners, right? So um, for every man that's having sex with dozens of women, where are those women coming from? It's always the, the harder thing. But um, it, does, uh, it does look like there's certainly more of a proclivity in men than women, but I couldn't find hard data of the kind you're asking for. I looked. That's what I thought the answer was going to be. What people say in questionnaires is very different, right, from what yeah. they do. So there was a question.